Chapter Twenty One of Concerning Isabel Carnby. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Concerning Isabel Carnby by Ellen Thornycroft Fowler. Chapter Twenty One As It Was in the Beginning. Sometimes mortals find the portals of the fairy land, and they straight away through the gateway enter hand in hand. There was a long silence, then Joanna said gently, Are you doubted if he loved you after this? Isabel only sobbed. My dear, I am very glad you have told me, Joanna continued, as she softly stroked Isabel's hair. It is an unspeakable joy to me to find that Paul never really fell below himself after all. But you mustn't tell anyone else. It is now Paul's secret and not yours. Oh, I must! I must tell the whole world how good Paul has been, and how vilely and cruelly it has misjudged him. You must do nothing of the kind. If Paul has jeopardized his literary reputation to keep a secret, no one has a right to tell that secret without his permission. Don't you see how it is? He has thought nothing in the whole world of so much importance as the screening of you. Therefore it would be cruel indeed of you to undo his life work in a fit of hysterical conscientiousness. But it would serve me right for people to know how horrid and selfish and cowardly I have been, cried Isabel. Probably it would. But now I am considering what is due to Paul, and not what is due to you, my dear. Oh, Joanna, can you ever forgive me? I'm afraid I couldn't have done so when I was strong and well. But as I told you, things are different with me now. Yes, I forgive you, Isabel, though I confess it isn't in me to forgive as Paul forgives nor to love as Paul loves, but I cannot in the least understand how either of you did what you have done. You are both incomprehensible to me. Tell me how it happened. After I had quarreled with Paul, I was in an awful bitter mood, because I thought he was hard and cold, and did not love me as I loved him. I was ashamed of caring for a man more than he cared for me, don't you see? I'm afraid I don't see, but never mind. Don't you see that if a man gives his love unrequited, he establishes at once a claim upon a woman's gratitude and all woman's sympathy, while well, if a woman does the same thing, she is despised by one man and derided by the rest? It wouldn't strike me in that light, but go on. Then it occurred to me that I would write a book which should convince Paul that I was a shallow, heartless woman of the world, and that I was incapable of really loving him or any other man. It was agony to my pride to feel that perhaps Paul had only cared for me because I was considered a good match, and I meant to turn the tables on him and wound his pride by making him believe that I had only been playing with him all the time just to amuse myself. A severe punishment on Paul for the freaks of your own imagination, my child. All the time I was writing the book, I thought only of him and how I could manage to hurt him. I did not care a straw whether the novel was a success or not, or whether anybody read it except Paul. But when it came out, it made a hit, as you know and everybody was talking about it. Yes, I remember. 
though people thought it clever they did not really like it and they said nasty things about the author joanna nodded nothing knew better than she did the nasty things that had been said yet she did not remove her caressing hand from the bent head and then continued isabel i was in a perfect frenzy of fear lest they should find out that i had written it and should begin to look shy at me i cared so much for approval and admiration that i thought it would kill me to be disapproved as society disapproves of the author of shams and shadows i used to lie awake at night wondering whatever i could do to put people off the scent well and what happened then one day when my terror was at its height i heard that paul had told lord robert thistledown that he had taken the name of angus gray i saw in a flash what that meant it meant that the man whom i had wounded and insulted understood better even than i did what a disadvantage the authorship of shams and shadows would be to me and had therefore shielded me at the expense of his own literary reputation and had taken my punishment upon himself joanna's eyes were shining it was a fine thing to do for paul's literary reputation was no light matter to him i know it wasn't it was the best thing he had and he gave it up to save me that night joanna lay awake thinking over the strange story she had heard it must be wonderful to be loved like that she said to herself and because nothing this side of heaven can quite stifle the cry of the human heart for human love if the human heart happened to be a woman's there were tears on joanna's lashes when at last she fell asleep isabel also lay awake that night torn by the conflicting emotions of love and pride and because when these two come into conflict the rest is a foregone conclusion she wrote the next day to paul my dear paul will you forgive me not because i deserve it but because i love you yours as you would isabel carnby then followed a season of great anguish of mine on isabel's part she now felt absolutely certain that paul no longer loved her and would therefore humiliate her by refusing her forgiveness and she decided that she should at once hide herself from the world in a sisterhood and spend the remainder of her disappointed days in conventual seclusion she even went so far as to decide that she should call herself sister mara because life had proved so bitter to her isabel was nothing if not dramatic the answer to her letter came by telegraph expect me thursday paul isabel was alone when this telegram was brought to her and as she read it she flushed with joy he hasn't wasted a minute she said to herself he must have started as soon as he had my letter and be travelling night and day without stopping she then looked at her reflection in a mirror and laughed softly because she was still young and a man loved her she was very human even at her best but when thursday came she was dreadfully frightened it was one thing to feel conscious of her power over paul while half a continent divided them and quite another to feel conscious of her power over her when she was expecting to see him face to face every minute when at last he did arrive joanna went into the hall to meet him but isabel was stricken with that paralyzing form of shyness which so often seizes us when our heart's desire is within our grasp and makes us wish for one mad moment to throw it away because we have longed for it so passionately 
so she remained alone in the salon and looked out of the window and her knees felt as if they were made of muslin like the knees of dolls then someone opened the door and shut it behind him and at that her heart beat so violently that the very snow-clad mountains outside began to tremble and shake as she looked at them with a supreme effort she turned round and tried to repeat the appeal for forgiveness which she had prepared but she could not utter a word because paul's arms were holding her fast and there was no need to utter a word because she had seen paul's face life's altar of roses is as rare as it is precious and it takes the sunshine of many summers and the braving of many thorns to produce a single drop but that drop when produced is worth all that it cost and the perfume of it will last for ever so paul and isabel thought during the next half hour after the lovers had returned to earth isabel said i shall now tell the whole world that i wrote that horrid book and that it has misjudged you all alone and then every one will know how splendidly you have behaved you shall do nothing of the kind sweetheart and paul kissed her again but i must i could not bear for you to bear the blame any longer still you will have to bear it my darling i could not bear any one to have it in his power to blame you and i must have my own way this time but it isn't fair i can't help that i can stand it very well when people say things against me but i could not stand it at all if people say things against you so i'm acting from purely selfish motives when i say that the secret must always be kept for my sake but paul how can i show my gratitude to you and my penance simply by doing what i ask and by giving no one any excuse for finding fault with my wife it was a horrid book said isabel sadly i know it was dear heart but you did not mean a word of it you know i wrote it in a temper a vile hateful disgusting temper I know you did, but the world might not understand this as well as I do, and therefore might misjudge you, and the world shall not have the chance. I really was frightfully angry with you, said Isabel, now reveling in the contemplation of dangers past. I used to rack my brains for things that I could write to vex you. When did you begin to love me again? queried paul isabel pondered for a moment i think i really must have loved you all the time or else i could not have hated you so paul laughed life had been so serious to him of late that it was delightful to hear a woman talk nonsense again and will you go on loving me always he said i shan't be able to help it when I once care for any one, I am like a five-pound note on Sundays. There is no possibility of changing me. My dear one, how sweet you are! How did you find out that I was the author? asked Isabel, trying to tie a knot in Paul's watch-chain. I knew it at once. I also knew that you had written it to hurt me and what is more that you had succeeded beyond your wildest expectations poor old paul did it make you very angry not angry but i confess it hurt me more than i had believed i was capable of being hurt but i soon forgot this in my fear of the secrets coming out as to who was the author and my knowledge of how much the disclosure of this secret would hurt you 
and then you decided to pretend that you had written it it seemed to me the only thing to do to ensure your permanent safety as when people once knew a thing they naturally ceased to speculate about it and they had already come to the conclusion that the book must have been written by someone in your set of course i knew that your publishers any day might show up my false pretenses and disgrace me in the eyes of the world which would never believe in the purity of my motives but would condemn me as an errant impostor to the end of the chapter but i also knew that your publishers would not do this without permission from you and angry as you were with me i did not think you would deal me this final and irrevocable blow because i felt sure you would understand my reasons and would know that i had done this somewhat doubtful action solely out of consideration for you i understand this at once i knew you would paul continued but you see dear other people might not have done so and they might have fancied i was no better than a literary thief trading upon a reputation which really was not mine isabel was silent for a moment then she said i told joanna i could not help it paul's face fell he could not bear to feel that even his sister should have the right to sit in judgment upon isabel and you must also tell your father and mother persisted isabel i could not be happy if i felt that they still misunderstood you i don't know about that but i do if you will give way to me just in this i will do what you want about everything else and no one but your own people shall ever know that i wrote shams and shadows and paul reluctantly consented shams and shadows made a lot of money said isabel but i could not touch a penny of it i hated it so much that i gave it all to charity paul could not help laughing a somewhat strange reason dear heart but by no means an uncommon one he said then followed a very happy week paul and isabel were naturally in a state of bliss and joanna rejoiced too and on her own account for the doctors told her that the heir of davos had done her all that they had hoped and far more than they had expected and assured her that she would get quite strong and well again and this fact doubled the happiness of the other two for paul loved his sister very dearly and isabel's heart was filled with thanksgiving to feel that she had been allowed to be in a measure the means of joanna's recovery and so had done something for paul in return for all that he had done for her but paul could not stay with them for more than a week so he went back to his work promising to return for joanna and isabel when spring returned to england when he had been back in london for about three weeks his father wrote to tell him that miss delicott was very ill and had expressed a great wish to see the minister's son once more so paul ran down home for a day or two things were brighter at the cottage than they had been for some time for mrs seaton had begun to gain strength as soon as she heard that all was well with her children and that health had returned to joanna and happiness to paul and her husband felt better and younger because she did paul had written to tell his mother that all was right again between himself and isabel he gave no explanations nor did mrs seaton require any for she was wise enough to know that if people love each other explanations are never needed and if they don't love each other 
no explanations will mend matters when paul went to see miss dalicott he found her extremely weak and shriveled up into a little raisin of a woman but her diction was as choice as ever it is unspeakingly gratifying to me to see your countenance once again my dear young friend she began and excessively kind of you to snatch a brief moment from the busy round of your incessant and onerous duties to give such pleasure to an infirm and aged woman who perhaps overstepped the rights of friendship in putting you to such trouble not at all miss drusilla i am awfully glad to see you again and i only wish that i could see you looking better that my dear paul is a wish which can never be fulfilled in this world but the young should not be made gloomy by the contemplation of sombre and serious subjects therefore let us divert our thoughts into a more invigorating and cheering channel so paul told the old lady about isabel and joanna and their life at davos and about his work in london and his hope that he and isabel would be married some time during the year then beginning while miss drusilla listened with the greatest interest and made her usual long-winded comments at last she said i feel that i owe it to you my dear young friend to offer some explanation of the fact of my so specially desiring to see your face once more and of my venturing to put you to the trouble and fatigue of a journey from london by the oracle expression of this desire on my part it is a pleasure rather than a trouble said paul kindly it was very good of you to want to see me and i was very pleased to come but all the same he really was surprised as naturally miss dalicott had never been a special friend of his the fact of the matter is continued the little spinster you bear a strong facial resemblance to some one for whom i entertained a warm regard a considerable number of years ago i dare say your sound and vigorous judgment and accidental physical lightness appears a somewhat unsound basis for interest or attachment but the fact remains that it does form such a basis in my case though i should agree with you that from an intellectual standpoint the position is untenable oh i can understand as much as that for actually i once held a poor woman's baby for her while she scrambled up to the top of a london omnibus and an extremely unattractive and unfanciful little brat it was simply because the woman looked tired and her eyes reminded me of isabel's dear me how very interesting i trust that you inform miss carnby of this somewhat romantic incident as it would surely have proved most gratifying to her oh no it wouldn't she would have been dreadfully hurt at being considered to resemble the middle-aged wife of an impetuous artisan women are never pleased at being thought like anybody who isn't well dressed i have discovered i remember isabel was quite angry once when i showed her a peasant girl by Jerus, and said it reminded me of her and she told me that if i said she was like a fashion plate she should have been far better pleased and she really would added paul laughing at the remembrance the feminine mind has certainly some strange inconsistencies murmured miss Ducilla, unconsciously straightening her cap of course it has that's why it is so fascinating i would not give a fig for a woman who had no bewitching little vanities and the funny thing is that they are not vain of the things which 
really are a credit to them but of the things which are a credit to their dressmakers now take isabel she is awfully pleased with herself when she has got a new frock on but she never knows that it is her figure which makes the frock look so well and she thinks far more about the color of her gowns than about the color of her eyes but here paul was mistaken i should have imagined that men with their robuster minds and sounder common sense would have despised such small vanities as these remarked miss dalicott not we we like them i always used to think that a profound and scholarly mind would not find happiness apart from profound and scholarly companionship and would experience an extreme distaste for what i might call foolish and frivolous society but i learnt afterwards that these views of mine were incorrect i am afraid they were a far-away look came into miss drusilla's faded eyes her thoughts had gone back to the long ago when i was comparatively young said she dreamily i was honored by the friendship of a most cultured and accomplished man he was a great scholar and under his tuition i made myself proficient in both greek and latin it is true that i loved learning for his own sake but i loved it still better for his and i worked long and late in order to render myself more fit for his companionship and more congenial to his taste as you will perceive i felt it only natural that so profound a mind should shrink from the society of the flippant and the unlearned i see said paul and his voice was very tender my friend's profession was tutorial continued miss delicourt and in later life he became the headmaster of one of our great public schools he and i were so intimately acquainted that i speculated much as to his future and i felt sure that if he ever did enter the holy estate of matrimony he would naturally required a helpmeet who would could assist him in the fulfillment of his scholastic duties and accompany him in his ceaseless pursuit after knowledge paul felt very pitiful the world is so full of sad little mistakes like this which are too pathetic to be said sometimes and too commonplace to be tragedies did you study very hard he asked indeed i did I overcame the difficulties of the Greek and Latin tongues with amazing rapidity, at least so my dear master did, and he counted me his most successful pupil. And then, said Paul, then it happened that a young lady came to pay a lengthy visit to friends in her neighborhood. She was well born and possessed considerable personal charm but her ignorance was something appalling i recall that she once asked before a room full of people whether homer wrote greek or latin and if caesar were a poet and miss dalicott fairly shuddered paul could not forbear smiling miss drusilla was so intensely shocked at the mere memory of those atrocities yet in spite of all this continued miss dalicott my friend married her why he did so was always incomprehensible to me as they two could not have had a single idea or interest in common yet he did it i shall never forget a visit i once paid to them not long after their marriage she endeavored to make use of a latin quotation and actually yes actually my dear paul she made it a false quantity and she the wife of a headmaster good gracious said paul 
whatever did the bridegroom do it was then that he showed the marvelous mobility and patience which always struck me as so much in my contemplation of his character i realized what he must have suffered as a false quantity was always torture to his cultivated sensible ear if one of his boys were guilty of such a thing he straightway chastised the offender when i made a false quantity he blamed me severely and said that his nerves could not stand it then what did he do to his bride my dear his amiability was something marvellous i was so grieved for him so ashamed that i could scarcely look up but he rose to the occasion he said not one single word of reproof though i know that many were burning upon his tongue but he just laughed and went up to his wife and kissed her do you ever hear of such an instance of more heroic self-restraint paul thought that he had but he did not say so he sympathized with miss drusilla but he also sympathized with the headmaster did she seem very much ashamed he asked not at all that was the most painful part of that most painful scene the careless young thing was as callous as she was illiterate she merely laughed as if it was nothing more than a joke and called my dear friends a silly boy it struck me and it strikes me still as most unseemly epithet for any right-minded woman to apply to her husband especially when he was a man of between thirty and forty years of age and one of the greatest greek scholars of his day where is your friend now miss dalicott sighed i grieve to say that his earthly career was closed some years ago his wife was taken first and he survived her only for the space of a few months some persons not intimately acquainted with the parties concerned said that his death was due to sorrow for hers but i think this statement must have been incorrect as so uneducated and frivolous a woman could never have been a thoroughly congenial companion to so erudite and wise a man therefore i conjecture that the approximation in the respective dates of his and her demise was merely a coincidence paul did not feel so sure of this he could imagine that a world depopulated of isabel would be quite too desolate for human habitation but all he said was it is an interesting little story so it was but the interesting part of it was the part that the poor little miss delicott was incapable of seeing people who tell us a story often tell far more than they intend and in fact far more than they themselves know they open the door that we may have a peep into their back garden and they have no idea that to us that peep includes a distant and extensive view which their short-sighted eyes have never beheld my friend was a most fascinating individual continued miss drusella dreamily endowed with unusual natural gifts which were perfected by the most assiduous study he was withal the most modest man i have ever met in person my dear paul you strongly resemble him it seems perchance strange for so trifling a detail to remain in one's mind for a period of over forty years yet i can still vividly recall the color of his hair which was precisely of the same shade as yours then paul said good-bye to the little spinster 
as she was growing too tired to talk any more, and he never saw her again. A fortnight after his visit to Chayford, Miss Drusilla died, and when her will came to be read, it was found that she had left her entire fortune, amounting to some thirty thousand pounds, to Paul Seaton. End of chapter 21 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 22 of Concerning Isabel Carnby This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Concerning Isabel Carnby by Ellen Thornycraft Fowler chapter twenty two for conscientious sake i hear a call through the silver night and across the golden day go forth and work for the fields are white and dare not disobey it was during the winter which joanna spent at davos that edgar ford screwed his courage to the sticking point sufficiently to ask Alice Martin to become his wife. By this time Alice's views of life had completely changed. She had not only forgotten that she had ever loved Paul, a comparatively trifling feat, she had not only fallen in love with someone else, an accomplishment likewise not difficult of feminine attainment, but she had succeeded in putting Edgar so completely in Paul's place that the change was retrospective, and Edgar was actually the richer for Alice's former devotion to Paul. She had not blotted out the sum of her old love. She had merely transferred it from Paul's account to Edgar's, which was a decidedly wiser plan, as thus no good material was wasted. All the dreams of her springtime and the romance of her early summer now went to the making of a rich harvest of affection for Edgar Ford to reap. Alice was one of the women who cannot live without loving. The man that such a woman happens to love is a mere matter of detail. To an artist his art is everything, and it is born in him the masters under whom he studies can only teach him style and manner and the tricks of his craft in after life the pupil may learn in other schools but he will always be a better artist because of the education which he received from the teachers who first trained him thus it is with women of the type of alice martin the power of loving is part of themselves and nothing can crush that out of them. They may learn technique from the master under whom they first study, but if in later days they turn to other teachers, that particular instructor will be forgotten, though they will always be able to love better because of the education which they received from him. It may be true that over the past not heaven itself has power. But in this respect, if it be so, certain women have the advantage of heaven, at least as far as their own feelings are concerned. They can recolor the past so as to make it a becoming background for the present, just as we can repaper our drawing rooms when we buy new furniture and they can change the cast of their little dramas long after the play has been played and the lights turned out. The conies are a feeble folk, but their strength lies in their power to make use of the rock so as to meet their own requirements. It was a better thing for Alice to love Edgar than it had ever been to love Paul, 
because Edgar was suited to her and Paul was not. A woman can always adapt herself to the man she loves, and be, for as long as she chooses, the sort of woman that he approves. But though it is not difficult for a woman to be somebody else instead of herself for a time, it becomes fatiguing if kept up too long. After a while it feels like walking in boots which are a shade too short, or biting crust when one has the toothache. It was a source of keen delight to Edgar that Alice shared his socialistic views with respect to the sanctity of the individual and the wrongfulness of riches. He did not know that she would have agreed with him just the same had he preached the subjugation of the masses and the divine right of kings. Alice, do you think you could ever love me? Edgar asked suddenly one day, when they two were practicing duets together. I think I have always loved you, she answered softly. This was no untruth. Alice had always loved the hero of the piece, that Paul had been for a time Edgar's understudy in the part, had no practical bearing on the case. Then will you be my wife? Yes. Edgar wanted to kiss Alice, but he refrained for fear of frightening her. Alice wanted Edgar to kiss her, and could not imagine why he did not do so. It was in things like this that Edgar made mistakes. He had never learnt that nine times out of ten other people want the same thing as we do, and if they don't, it doesn't so very much matter as long as we get our own way. I do not wish to deceive you, he said, or to win your love under false pretenses though that love is the desire of my heart. But my wife will have no luxury, though the world counts me a rich man. I don't want luxury, replied Alice. I only want you. Do you mean to say you dare face a life of toil and poverty for my sake? Of course I do. Don't you understand that I care for nothing but being with you? and feeling that you are pleased with me? Then Edgar took her in his arms and kissed her, and Alice's cup of bliss was full. You know my views about money, Edgar said, and that I hold it a sin for any man to live a life of ease and pleasure while his fellow men are starving. Well, I simply cannot go on any longer living my present life when I know of the sea of sin and suffering and sorrow all around me. I feel I must go down into the midst of it and do something for those weaker brethren for whom Christ died. Alice's beautiful face was aglow with excitement. I will come down with you and stand by your side. I think it is splendid of you to give up everything for the sake of the poor and I am proud to be the woman you have chosen to help you to bear this burden and to take up this cross. My darling, do you think you can be quite happy without horses and carriages and all the external trappings of wealth? I should rather think I could. I don't care a bit about things like that. Mamma thinks they are important but they have always bothered me ever since I was a little girl, and used to think it a treat to walk out to tea instead of having the carriage. But you will be a rich woman on your own account, Alice, and you must do what you will with your own. I shall give it all to you to do whatever you like with, and it will help us to help others all the more. Then will you come and live with me down at the Stepney Settlement, in connection with Hampton House, and take your part in the work there? asked Edgar. It is a grand field for labor, and the laborers are as yet few. Of course I will, 
I will go anywhere with you and do anything for you as long as I live. My brave little girl. Alice slipped her hand into his, and I will always act as you bid me and obey you in everything, if only you promise never, never to be cross with me. I think it would kill me if ever you were vexed with me. So you won't be, will you? I? Vexed with you? My dearest, the thing is unthinkable. Then I don't care what happens, said Alice contently. But you were once awfully cross with me, you know. My child, what on earth do you mean? Oh, it was one time, ages and ages ago, when you never would speak to me if you could help it, and it used to make me so miserable. You really were cross then, and Alice's disengaged hand wandered idly over the keys. Not cross, dear, only very, very unhappy, because I loved you and I did not think you would ever love me. Alice raised her pretty eyebrows. Well, that was hardly the way to make me love you, was it? It wasn't likely that I should fall in love with a man in a temper, at least I mean to say with a man who looked as if he were in a temper. Do you think you would have loved me then, Alice, if you had known that all my outside sternness was merely the mask I put on to hide my love for you? Tell me, dear, I want to know. Alice thought for a moment. I expect I should, for I have always adored the shape of your nose. Edgar laughed, and Alice went on. I used to be afraid that I bored you because I wasn't clever. But now you don't mind my not being clever a bit, do you? My darling, I hate clever women. A woman is meant to be beautiful and good, and cleverness simply spoils her. Then don't you admire Isabel Carnby? Alice was still a woman, though she was ready to go down and live in the Stepney settlement. I couldn't exactly say that I don't admire her. She is so modern and up-to-date that I regard her as a sort of national institution that one ought to feel proud of, a specimen of what the nineteenth century can produce but she never attracts me in the least. She is cold and brilliant and hard, like a diamond, and has nothing lovable about her, as far as I can see. Alice drew a little contented sigh. And she isn't really pretty, is she? Not at all. I never can bear blue eyes. They are always cold and unsympathetic, I think. What colored eyes do you like best? brown like velvet and hair to match a complexion like a rose leaf alice laughed a low happy laugh i'm so glad you don't mind my being stupid you are not stupid dear you are full of tact which is infinitely better than cleverness see how well you can talk to the poor and how you can make them love you you have a happy knack of always saying the right thing. I'm so glad. You don't know how hard I try to be the sort of woman that you approve of. I am always thinking of you and of what I can do or say to please you. Dear Alice, said Edgar tenderly, you overpower me with that feeling that I can never do enough to deserve all this love. No, Edgar, it is I who ought to be grateful, because whatever niceness there is in me is all your doing. It is you who have molded my character and formed my opinions, so that whatever good I may do in this world must be put down to your credit and not mine, which is quite true, and Edgar had every reason to be proud of his handiwork. There was joy at the Cedars because of Alice's engagement to Edgar Ford. Miss Martin fairly beamed. She felt that Providence had 
had a hand in the matter which she was perfectly true nevertheless when providence had seemed to be bringing about a union between her daughter and paul seaton mrs martin like a troublesome politician was not willing to serve under the leader in power in this respect she was by no means singular we are all naturally more submissive to the decrees of heaven when those decrees are in accordance with our own desires my dear she said to her daughter i am sure you will be very happy because a woman naturally requires one stronger than herself to lean upon and besides edgar is an only son so whatever his parents have to leave will come to him i could never have been happy as an old maid mamma the feeling that nobody needed me or cared for me would have killed me mrs martin stitched at her bizarre work with a complacent smile i know it would love you have such a very affectionate nature and it is difficult for a single woman to take any social position unless she is a lady of title alice listened dutifully and her mother rambled on it will be so nice for you dear when edgar goes into parliament for i hear that members of parliament and their wives are received in the highest circles it is a pity dear edgar isn't a conservative there is always such refinement about conservatives but that cannot be helped i suppose oh mamma edgar would never become a conservative i am not suggesting that he should my love but perhaps in time you might persuade him to become an old-fashioned whig and that i believe is almost as aristocratic still i cannot help wishing that he had be a conservative in the first instance you see a radical may be a gentleman but a conservative must be one i don't see that don't you love well i can hardly explain it to you but i have a feeling that it is more correct to be a conservative but i could not try to make edgar go against his own convictions mamma mrs martin paused for a moment while she selected a fresh thread of silk then she said ah my love if you want to get on in society you must think more about conventions than convictions and since edgar persists in remaining radical i would ignore it if i were you but there is nothing to be ashamed of in one's politics persisted alice men have a right to think what they like still my dear if one espoused the cause of the people it might lead to the impression that one has risen from the people and that would be extremely painful to any one especially to a person with my sensitive feelings alice however was obstinate it was her one fault and she freely indulged in it we are risen from the people she said that is merely the truth her mother sighed as she thread her needle when you have lived as long as i have my dear you will find that the truth is generally vulgar and invariably inexpedient edgar and i don't mean to behave like rich people or go in for society but to live among the poor and try to help them mrs martin smiled indulgently young men often get strange socialistic notions like that into their heads but a few drops of nitre on a lump of sugar soon put them all right again but i don't want to put edgar all right as you call it mamma the reason why i love him so dearly is that he is so good and unworthily and has such high ideals my dear child he will be all right when he is married my experience is that there is nothing like getting married for curing young men of ideals and nonsense 
of that kind your dear papa never bothered his head about ideals after he married me edgar says the truth is stronger than everything and that the height of good breeding is never to be ashamed of anything persisted alice whose strength was at the strength of ten when she had edgar says to back up her opinions my dear child i am double edgar's age and i have learnt that bare facts like everything else require clothing and that the more becoming the clothing the more effective the facts mrs martin had learnt a great deal during the last ten years she had got on in the world and the world had taught her much and found her an apt pupil it is the world's business to cover its vessels with the very best electroplate this is all that it undertakes to do and it never pretends to be a depot for hall marked articles if we give ourselves up to the world's hardening process and duly worship rank and wealth and success and all other licensed gods it will hide our weaknesses under its elegant electro covering and we shall shine for a while like burnished silver but the real metal is found elsewhere in the spring of the year the long-expected dissolution was announced excitement ran high all through the country as the general election approached and michael ford was full of delight to think that at last he should see his life's ambition realized and his son a member of parliament but when he mentioned the subject to that son edgar for the first time in his life was not amenable to his father's wishes i am sorry that i can ever say to disappoint you but i cannot stand at this election he said mr ford was dumbfounded my dear boy what on earth do you mean you have plenty of money and no business cares to occupy your time and attention and at clayford the thing will be simply a walk over it isn't that i am afraid of not getting in it is something quite different from that if i thought it right to stand no amount of opposition would deter me then what is it if you think that your views are too advanced to please me you need have no further hesitation on that score i have long ago learnt that the ways of old folks are too slow for the younger generation and that we must be content to let the stream flow on as quickly as it will and not attempt to let or hinder it edgar longed to spare his father the pain which he was felt bound to inflict but this was impossible he had dallied long enough and now the time had come to speak out i have made up my mind and nothing can alter me he began and his face was very white for a long time my duty to you has been in conflict with the duty which i owe to a higher power but now a crisis has come and i feel i must hesitate no longer mr ford did not speak so edgar went on i do not feel it right for me to be living in luxury while so many of my fellow men are perishing with hunger i do not feel it right for me to be living in idleness while so many of my brethren cry out for help the call has come for me to go out into the highways and hedges and compel all that are bidden to come in to the feast and it is a call which may not be disobeyed but my dear edgar did it never occur to you that you might serve god and your generation more effectually as an influential statesman than as a hysterical socialist mr ford's voice was hard and dry but edgar's face was alight with an enthusiasm which no worldly wisdom could quench 
my dear father you know as well as i do that it is not in me to become a statesman or even an ordinary politician i could never merge myself into my party or content myself with compromises i should always be fighting little battles of my own and tilting at windmills which nobody but myself could see i do not belong to any party i have too many fads and scruples to identify myself with any political school therefore i should now be justified in asking any constituency to return me as its member it would be unfair to my constituents and unfair to myself mr ford played with a paper knife but he did not say anything what was the use i do not deny edgar continued that a politician is called to do great and necessary work i merely say that i am not called upon to be a politician oh father do not tempt me i know all the arguments that you would use and i have tried in vain to stifle my own conscience with them over and over again i have lived an upright and honorable life but that is not enough i have kept my heart pure and my hands clean but that is not enough through it all i can hear one voice speaking sell all thou hast and give to the poor and dare i turn away because i have great possessions michael ford sighed heavily but still he did not speak his face looked ten years older than it had looked ten minutes ago it cuts me to the heart to hurt you like this after all that you have done for me continued edgar and his voice trembled but i see my way plain before my face and i dare not turn aside for he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me then what do you intend to do asked mr ford wearily looking across his writing-table at the young man standing by the fireplace i intend to join the hampton house settlement at stepney and to live with the poor and for the poor and i hope to spend the rest of my life in trying to comfort broken hearts and to brighten darkened homes i have closed my ears to the cry of the suffering humanity long enough too long alas but at least they have been reopened and after ephaphilia has once been pronounced a man cannot but listen to the cries of his fellows and to the commands of his god what does alice say to all this the mention of alice's name gave her lover fresh courage she agrees with me in all of my decisions he said and she is ready to share in all my efforts in fact it is her enthusiasm which has inspired and sustained me and has renewed my strength when i felt ready to fall are you aware that both you and alice will each have very large fortune of your own some day mr ford asked dryly is any fortune too large to give to god was edgar's response michael ford saw that the case was hopeless therefore he wasted no more time in discussing it he knew that it is possible by means of argument to convince a man's judgment and even to overcome his prejudices but arguing against a man's conscience is sorry work ninety-nine times out of a hundred it meets with no success and the hundredth entails a responsibility which is harder to bear than failure when edgar left him mr ford sat for a while buried in thought it is the way of the world he said to himself one man is born to wealth and power and success and he flings them all away another man has everything against him and he climbs to the top of the tree 
the son of the rich man serves while the son of the poor man sits down to meat and one man labors in order that another man's son may enter into his labors certainly fate has a sense of humor then he took up his pen and wrote to paul seaton end of chapter twenty two recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter twenty three of concerning isabel carnby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c concerning isabel carnby by ellen thornycroft fowler the election they fought all day with might and main and when the sun was set the victors longed to fight again the vanquished to forget paul seaton was one of the men who possesses the useful knack of knowing when the tide of their affairs is at the flood so when mr ford asked him to come down and fight the liberal battle at chayford in edgar's stead paul consented without an hour's delay at the beginning of the campaign joanna came home completely restored to health bringing isabel with her and the inhabitants of the cottage gave themselves up body and soul to the election and talked and thought and dreamed of nothing else great was the excitement all over england and chayford was no exception to the rule for three weeks paul made several speeches per day and was treated as if he were a combination of juggernaut and a popular preacher with a flavor of royalty thrown in everybody in the town including even the babies and the cats wore colors if it were nothing better than a scrap of tea paper and there was all that delicious love of fighting in the air which makes an election like a glorious war with no death or danger in it isn't it fun exclaimed isabel one day i adore every minute of it it makes you hate the other side with such an exquisite frenzy of hatred which has neither malice nor uncharitableness in it and yet which is so charmingly violent while it lasts i know agreed joanna it is that nice sort of hatred which would never let you really injure people but which makes you want their chimneys to smoke and their hats to blow off isabel laughed and your love for your own side is equally enjoyable i assure you i feel the most fervent glow of affection for all the liberals in chayford just as if they were relations as it was christmas day yet all the time you know that these feelings will completely die out within a week of the declaration of the poll added joanna of course you do that is why they are so delightful feelings that last take a good deal out of you i have discovered the really delicious sort are those that you think will last for ever and that you know won't said isabel i am afraid my dear girl that you are becoming an epicure in emotions remarked paul who had just come in i know i am an election supervening on a love affair is enough to intoxicate any woman especially when the beloved object and the candidate are one you can't think what glorious thrills i have all down my back when the crowds applaud you liberalism and love combined so overwhelm my soul that i feel you are the only man in the whole world and the english nation rolled into one and i am as tearful as if people were singing god save the queen and odd robin gray at the same time oh it is a delicious feeling and i am eternally grateful to you for giving it to me 
Paul beamed with delight, but, being a man, did not say pretty things before a third person. Isabel, being a woman, did. I adore elections, she continued, waltzing round the room. They are simply heavenly. A general election and my idea of heaven are by no means synonymous, replied her lover quietly. My idea of heaven is pretty much the same as Beatrice's, Isabel said. I shall go where the bachelors sit, and there live as merry as the day is long. I shall say, please reserve the place next to Mr. Paul Seaton for me, and if I find it already occupied, there will be unpleasantness, and I shall contest the seat. You are very brilliant today, and Paul looked at her proudly. She was worth looking at just then, as she had dressed herself entirely in blue, the liberal color in Chaford, and a woman always looks her best when her gown is the same shade as her eyes. It is this lovely election. It has got into my head. Well, don't let it tire you. I would rather lose the seat than that you should knock yourself up in helping me to win it. I'm glad you have warned her, said Joanna. I am sure she works too hard, but she won't listen to me. She has too much spirit for her strength. An anxious expression came over Paul's face. You do look a bit tired, Isabel, he said. Rubbish, she replied. Then she looked at herself in the glass. Should you call me a brilliant woman or a sweet woman? She asked thoughtfully. Brilliant, replied Joanna. Both, replied Paul. That is absurd. I can't be both. Nobody could. But you are. Isabel carefully arranged her fringe. That is just like your interesting but incomprehensible sex. My good sir, if you happen to care for a woman, you at once endow her with every possible virtue, totally irrespective of the fact that some of the virtues won't go together. Oh, that is what we do, is it? Now we women behave differently. If we love a man, we don't plaster him over with all the good qualities, but we merely say that the virtues he doesn't possess are not virtues at all, and that no decent man would be seen with such things. But though the modus operandi in each case is different, the result is the same. That is to say, the beloved object in both instances has the monopoly of human excellencies. Well, I must be off, said Joanna, rising. I have some work to do. After his sister had left the room, Paul made up his deficiency in the saying of pretty things. Where is Isabel? asked Mrs. Seaton of her daughter, as the latter was going out. With Paul in the drawing-room. Mrs. Seaton drew a sigh of perfect contentment. That is all right. What they have to say to each other that they are always wanting to be alone together, I cannot imagine, continued Joanna. I never said anything in my life to anybody that a third person was not welcome to hear. Her mother smiled. You have not said all that there is to be said yet, then. Evidently not. There are still some things in heaven and earth undreamed of in my philosophy, and what those two good people talk to each other about is one of them. If I were Isabel, I could say all I wanted to say before us all, I am certain. But you couldn't if you were Paul, my dear. Joanna rolled up her umbrella. Well, mother, I don't pretend to understand it. I could never exchange confidences with anybody for all those hours on end, least of all with a man. I should be graveled for lack of matter in no time, but those dear, silly people go on for sixty minutes at a stretch, and then, if I happen to disturb them, look at me as reproachfully as if they had only had five seconds together instead of a long hour by shrewbury clock 
Among the most enthusiastic of Paul's political supporters was the faithful Marta. Whenever she was able, she attended his meetings and regarded them almost as a means of grace. I don't believe that the Pope of Rome or the President of the Conference could make finer speeches than Master Paul does, she said one day as she was dusting the drawing room and Joanna was arranging the flowers. Joanna laughed. He is certainly a born orator, Martha. He plays upon his audience as if he were playing upon an organ. He does indeed, miss, and never seems at a loss for a word. I am bound to say I didn't think Master Paul had it in him to speak like that. When you listen to him, you wonder how the folks that think differently have managed to keep themselves out of the lunatic asylums, and that is the sort of speaking and the sort of preaching that does real good to my thinking. Still, I suppose one ought to hear both sides of the question, argued the wise Joanna. Certainly not, miss. There is nothing so unsettling. Besides, where's the good? Only one side can be right. That is plain. And what is the use of wasting the time in listening to the side that is wrong? But, Martha, how can you tell which side is right without hearing both? Martha dusted so fiercely that the ornaments fairly danced. Bless your dear heart! If you are a woman, you know who is right and who is wrong, before you've heard a single word. And if you are a man, you don't know who is right and who is wrong after you've heard all there is to be said. But Mr. Paul's speeches are very convincing, all the same, especially to folks as think the same as he does to begin with. Oratory is a great power remarked Joanna, half to herself. It must be lovely to see hundreds of people hanging upon every word that you utter, and to know that you can sway them for the time being as it pleases you. It must indeed, my dear. In fact, it seems almost too great a power to be put into the hands of a man, even though the man be dear Master Paul himself. But it is a wonder to me that men get on in the world as well as they do, considering that they know nothing and can't bear to be taught. They say Providence takes special care of children and naturals, so I suppose Providence looks after men in the same sort of way. It wasn't so, goodness knows what would become of them, the unmarried ones in particular. You used to be such a strong conservative, Joanna suggested, as she filled a vase with daffodils. So I was, miss. At one time the conservatives seemed to me to do the least mischief of the two parties, because they were better able to mind their own business and leave the country to look after itself. As I have often passed the remark, interference is the one thing that I can't stand. I have no objection to speaking a word in season or out of season whenever I think it is needed, but I know my own business, and I won't stand being taught it by anybody, and I take it the country is the same as me, miss, and don't want governments to come poking their noses into things that don't concern them. So now I suppose you are a liberal. Martha? Well, I don't know that I'd go as far as that, replied Martha cautiously. My father was a liberal, and the love of reform got into his blood till he couldn't eat a bit of bacon without telling us how much better it might have been cooked if he'd had the doing of it himself. I've noticed, miss, that when the master of a house is a reformer, there's often trouble in the kitchen, so I set my face against reforms of any kind, as it were, and the good woman shook her duster to and fro, as if the whole Liberal Party were wrapped up in it. 
still some changes are improvements persisted joanna i never came across them miss it seems to me that a new way of governing the country is like a new way of frying potatoes the potatoes are no better than they were before and the grease always smells still my dear i am no longer a conservative take my word for that what made you change your politics joanna asked why the way the conservatives have turned against our paul as long as they kept themselves to themselves and acted according to their lights i had no objections to them though i confess they sometimes made mistakes like their betters but when they turned against master paul it was a different thing and then i washed my hands once for all of the whole boiling of them joanna smiled as she disposed of her last daffodil martha's politics were so essentially feminine as long as a political party contents itself with revolutionizing states and annexing continents and disestablishing churches and other trifling pastimes such as these no right-minded woman troubles her head about it these things amuse it and do not hurt her but when the political party takes advantage of this patience and forbearance on her part and goes to the length of actually contesting the seat in parliament of some particular man the sleeping tigress wakes up and shows all the claws wherewith provident nature has endowed her which conduct is after all only natural and the offending faction has no one but itself to blame but it is the same with parties as with individuals if one gives them an inch they take an l at last the day of the chaffered election dawned and as is the way of election days it was so long that it seemed as if the sun had stood still to watch the battle as it did in the time of joshua but it came to an end at last and the little party at the cottage sat up till midnight awaiting paul and the result at first everybody said it would be a walkover but anybody who knows anything about electioneering will be aware that however certain a seat may be and however enormous the majority last time fears come with fighting whilst agonizing doubts foreshadow the declaration of the poll paul's little home circle felt very anxious and the more they doubted the result the more they kept repeating that there was no room for doubt at all the liberal majority at chaford at the last election had been nine hundred and they continually assured each other and themselves that a majority of that size could no more melt away than an alp could you see said mr seaton though of course it might have diminished a majority of that size could not possibly have transformed itself into a minority in three years he was thinking to himself that if only four hundred and fifty voters had gone over to the other side paul would be beaten of course not replied joanna the result really is a foregone conclusion it is only a question as to the size of the majority she felt sure that the conservative papers could not write as they did and if they had not grounds for their hope of which she knew nothing it is really absurd to think that a mere boy like lord galley should beat a brilliant politician like paul the idea is simply ludicrous exclaimed isabel but she wished to goodness that paul had not had an aristocrat for his opponent as there is an underlying respect for titles at the bottom of every british heart it is no use our expecting paul for a couple of hours yet remarked paul's mother it would be impossible for him to be here before then she was feeling that something dreadful must have happened either that the mob had killed paul or else had not elected him otherwise he would have been home an hour ago 
and so they went on telling little comforting fibs to each other and inwardly wondering how much longer this suspense could be endured suddenly they heard the sound of wheels and the stamping and shouting of a multitude here he is said mr seaton gently and he went very white and took his wife's hand joanna and isabel were past speaking so they tried to laugh and failed the noise grew louder the crowd had taken the horses out of paul's carriage and were drawing it along with deafening cheers at last they pulled up at the cottage gate and paul sprang out and thanked them and rushed inside it is all right he cried i am in with a majority of twelve hundred then he went straight up to isabel and kissed her before them all i am very glad i have won he said simply because it gives me something to give you who have given me so much so it came to pass that the old wastes and the former desolations were built up and repaired in the life of paul seaton and the name of the builder and repairer was love a few days after the election while paul was helping a brother candidate and joanna was working in her district isabel made her confession to paul's father and mother she told them the whole story how she had written shams and shadows in a fit of temper how paul had saved her from the consequences of her mad act how she had selfishly let him bear the blame how his love for her had at last conquered the weakness and worldliness of her nature and taught her that it is not in the power of outside things to make a woman happy and how she had promised to keep the secret all her life after she had once told the truth to his own people i could not rest till i had your forgiveness she said in conclusion but if you will only say you forgive me i have promised i will never mention the subject again i forgive you utterly my child replied the minister the deed shall be blotted out as though it never been and i thank my son for having taught me how divine a thing sometimes is human love and you whispered isabel to mrs seaton paul's mother took isabel in her arms of course i forgive you my dear one because paul has forgiven you and because you have loved much and i thank you for having given my son back to me again i understand said isabel softly the paul that you know never could have written that horrid book so you felt that there were two pauls that was just it mrs seaton replied and i could not make the two pauls agree with one another in my mind but now you have not only given the old paul back to me you have shown me that he is not merely as good as i believed he was but infinitely nobler and better than i had dreamed i did not think that my son could ever have written shams and shadows but on the other hand i did not think that he could ever have performed so noble an act of self-sacrifice as this so you have restored him to me fourfold i can never forgive myself sobbed isabel mrs seaton drew the weeping girl close to her my dear you must for paul's sake remember he loves you so much and he could not forgive anybody for not forgiving you and we must not forget added the minister that it is love for you which has made paul into the man he is so you have had much to do with the making of paul and therefore his mother and i love you for it i did not do it it was god who made paul what he is and i was just the instrument mr seaton smiled exactly dear but there is nothing remarkable in that the man who does the most is nothing more than god's instrument for fulfilling his purposes and the man who does the least is no less than that but we love best the instruments whereby the most good is wrought and so also i think 
does god paul and his mother were left together for a few minutes that evening my dear she said isabel has told me everything paul's face fell i am sorry she told you mother but she would do it don't be sorry paul it is the greatest joy to me to find that i have nothing for which to blame my dear son but that he has been all that i believed and hoped and far more still i had rather that you blamed me than that you blamed her that is the one thing that i could not bear even from you mother i do not blame her as i blamed you the two cases are so different don't you know that when a woman is angry she is far more than she means but that a man however angry never says as much so one can hardly pass the same judgment on the utterances of both paul looked relieved you think then that she was but no i may find fault with what she writes but never with what she is and no one else shall find fault with her at all you will remember that this confidence is sacred mother and that no one but my father and joanna must ever share it with you certainly you may trust us paul and you will love isabel always always dear both for your sake and her own end of chapter twenty three recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c